Wherever you are around the world today, it's great you can be here with us. Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to have you with us uh, right now. Can I ask you this question? If you were to define and describe your life right now, would you describe your life as good or great? If you were to look at your marriage right now, would you stop and say that your marriage is good or is it great? In your study life, are you getting the results you want? Are they good or are they great? In your career, is, is the results you're getting or the career you have good or is it great? Because the truth is, when we look at the scriptures, the scriptures are very clear that, that there's a particular way that we are called to live and that we're called to live above so often what many of us experience. And Jesus addressed this right in the very beginning of Matthew's gospel. We read that Jesus starts to do ministry. He wanders around doing ministry and teaching. And then Matthew has the very first kind of extensive teaching of Jesus. I heard someone recently call it, well, Jesus, Jesus's first leadership training. He goes up onto a hill and it becomes called the Sermon on the Mount. And he goes up on a hill and he begins to give this teaching about about how people are meant to live. And he's effectively declaring a new kingdom. And as he declares this new kingdom, he, he begins to say there's certain ways that we're meant to live within our life. And so if we read in, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, we read this amazing story, this, this amazing story about how he talks about how we're meant to live. And he says this in Matthew, chapter 5, verse 38. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second. And give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. Jesus comes along and he says this, if you want to live a great life, if you want to live an amazing life, you have to do more than just the ordinary. You have to do more than will just get you a good result. There are some of you, if you're truthful, you've got a good marriage, you don't have a great marriage. There are some of you, if you're truthful, you're a good parent, you're not a great parent. There are some of you, when it comes to your study, you'll do okay in your study. You know, but you're not doing great. There are some of us in our careers, some people in our careers, if you're truthful, you've got a good career, you'll get by, but you haven't got a great career. And when we look at the principles of what Jesus espoused right there at the beginning, when he gives this first major teaching that Matthew talks about, Jesus always comes along and he always says, do more than what's required. Jesus always said, step further along than what you need to do. Do more than what people say is meant to be done. Now, as we know, the people of, the people of Israel at that time, the time of Jesus, were an occupied people. The Roman legions had conquered them as they had much of the known world. And the law at that time said that if a Roman soldier, a Roman soldier came along and dropped their bundle on the ground and then pointed to you and said, hey, carry it. The law said you had to carry it no matter who you were, no matter what your position was, no matter what you were doing, you had to carry it one mile. And, and you couldn't object. You couldn't object. And, and what has Jesus said? Jesus says, hey, if you, if, you, if, if you have to walk one mile, walk two. Jesus constantly comes along and he says, do extra. Look, read it again. Have a look at this on the screen. Uh, he says, if you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the evildoer. Uh, but if anyone strikes you on, the che on your right cheek, turn the other also. Uh, and if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also a second and give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. Jesus effectively is saying, if you want success, if you want greatness, you want greatness, you want to live according to the kingdom values, then do extra, go extra in your life. And when you see this principle in the scriptures, when you see this principle in the spiritual life, you stop and you go, oh my goodness, as you read the Bible, what you see is it's written everywhere. All through the Bible, you read these stories of, of when people did extra, God blessed. 
when people did more than what was required, God blessed. But there are many stories in here where people just did enough. Oh, they, you know, you can have a good marriage. You can be, have a good marriage. You're still married. It's just not all it could be. You can have a good career. It just may not be all that it could be. You can be a good parent. You can be a good mum. You can be a good dad. But you're not all that you could be. And what the scriptures seem to tell us is go, do the extra. Do the extra. Do the extra. And you can see story after story after story of this. Well, here's one story that is very famous uh, about, about doing extra. Now, as I share with you this story, I, I don't want you to be thinking about my life. I don't want you thinking about anybody else's life. I want you just to think about yourself. Just think about yourself. And you can stop and say, well, I'm a great grandma now. You know, it might be a bit late for me. No, it's not. It's not. It, it, the way the kingdom of God works is when you hear the word and it takes plant in us, it's from then and on that, that it matters. Well, if we go to Matthew chapter 17, verse 37, we read the story of David and Goliath. Now, if you read the story of David and Goliath, um, it's a fascinating story. Um, and just to give you some context, because we don't have time to read it all, if you, re if you read the whole story, is, is the people of Israel are lined up against the Philistines who are the enemy, and they're going to fight. But often in those wars, in those times, and we see it in some movies where the, you pick the best of your fighters and you say, well, you two go and fight. And so that there's not mass carnage and mass death, the, you pick the best of your fighters. We'll pick the best fighter we've got. They fight and whoever wins, well, we'll accept that that's, uh, that, that, that's who the winner of the whole battle is. And that way not everybody gets killed and there isn't all this death and destruction. Well, this giant of a man by the name of Goliath, sounds big, Goliath, comes out and every day he taunts the people of Israel. And he says to them, you know, he basically says, come on, pick your best guy, come out. And, and, he, and he abuses the people of Israel. But when everybody looks at him, he's big. He's big. He's not little like me. He's big. And so everybody and the people of Israel are frightened. Well, one day, this young boy by the name of David, just a shepherd, a shepherd boy, he goes down to take some food to his, to his brothers who were, in the, who were in the army. And he goes down and when he's there, he sees Goliath come out and Goliath challenge all the people of Israel, the army of Israel. Come on, send out your best. Come on, send them out. And he sees the people of Israel all shaking in their boots and he can't believe it. Now, he's just a kid. He's just, you know, he's not physically mature. He's just, a, he's just young. He's just a teenager. And, and, and he, he can't believe it. And so he goes to the king. He goes to the king of Israel and he says, I'll fight. I'll fight. Now, he's got a reason why he thinks that. He says, I'll fight. And so we read a story starting in, in Matthew chapter, uh, sorry, 1 Samuel 17, verse 37. And it says, and David said, the Lord who saved me from the poor and the lion, from the poor of the bear, will save me from the hand of the Philistine. So Saul said to him, said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. Now, what's happened is this. He goes to the king. He goes to King Saul. He says, I'll go fight. I'll go fight. And Saul says to him, you're just a boy. You're just a boy. You're not going to win. And, and, and David says, no, no, no. He said, well, I've looked after the sheep. He said, I've, I've defeated the, the lion and I've defeated the bear. God will be with me in, in the midst of this, right? And so, and so he comes along in verse 38. So Saul clothed David with his armour. He put an, a bronze helmet on his head and he clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped Saul's sword over the armour and he tried in vain to walk for he was not used to them. So in other words, Saul does, if you're going to go off to battle, you're going off to war, what he does is he dresses him in, in, the, in the clothes, the warrior clothes, in the armour. But Saul, but, but little David just being young and also not having been a trained soldier, he can't walk. He can't walk in this stuff. And then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these for I'm not used to them. So David removed them. And then he, then David, took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones from the wadi, from the creek. And he put them in his shepherd's bag in the, in the pouch. His sling was in his hand and he drew near the, uh, the Philistine. 
Now, many people know this story. It's folklore. We hear it in society all the time of the little guy picking on the big guy. We, we hear of stories of the little person taking on the giant corporation, the Goliath against uh, the, the, the little person. Um, and so David goes down to the creek and he thinks, well, I'm going to go into a battle. I'm going to fight. But David doesn't go along and pick up one stone. How, how many did it say he picked up? It says he picked up five stones. Why would he pick up five stones? He knew he was going to battle. He's planning. I'm going into a fight. I've, I've told everybody I'm going to do this. Why am I going to do this? Do you think he thought to himself, I'm going to need some spares? What happens if I miss? What happens if I miss this big Goliath of a man? You know, do you, do you think well, that's, that's what he thought? See, I don't think that. I think, I think when you read the scriptures, I think what you see in David is this utter confidence that God was on his side. I think what you see when you hear, when you hear uh, David speak in a minute, what you hear is David convinced that God would guide this stone that hit this from his slingshot and guide it straight into Goliath and that he would defeat him. Have a look at this. Look at 1 Samuel 17 verse 45. But David said to the Philistine, so David speaks to Goliath and he says, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. So, so David immediately, he says, he said, I don't just come here as David, the shepherd boy. I come here in the name of God and you are abusing, you are insulting the armies of the living God. And so I come here today in the name of God. In verse 46, this very day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. David doesn't stop and say, this very day, I'm going to beat you. He doesn't. He says, this day, God, the Lord, will deliver you into my hand. So God is going to be the one who's going to defeat you. I'm going to be the one who is the actual one who's applying it, but God is going to be at work. And I'll strike you down and I'll cut off your head and I'll give, you, and I'll give the dead bodies of the Philistines army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth so that all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel and that all this assembly, all the army gathered may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into your hand. David says it's not going to be because people look and say, look how good a fighter David is. Look how big and strong and muscular he is. Look at how trained he is. Look at how resourced he is. No, no, no. People are going to say, you won this battle because God was with you. Um, God is thinking, I think David is thinking to himself, I'm not going to need a second stone. No, no, no. Now, why, why, so why did he go and get five? Why did he go and get five stones? Well, if you read in 2 Samuel, and we're not going to read it for saves time. If you read in 2 Samuel chapter 21, 15 to 22, we read, we read in the King James Version, in the, in the NRSV Version, some translations say that, that, that Goliath had a brother and three sons. Other translations say that, the, that his, he had a brother and his three sons were from his people. Right? But what we know is that in those days of battle, in those days of battle, when someone entered into a battle, the nearest of kin would stand up to fight in the honour of the place of the person who was defeated. And so, and so the, the New King James Version of the Bible tells us that if Goliath was killed by David, then David was also going to have to contend with his brother. And then he was going to have to contend with, if he defeated his brother, his son, his oldest son, and then his middle son, and then his youngest son. And so, and so, so Goliath, sorry, David, when he went down the creek, what he did, did is he was prepared to win, but he didn't go with one stone. He went with five stone because he went ready to fight until it was done. He took the five stones to take all of them, all of them out. So this second story is just not the story of someone who just did enough. He didn't just go and go, oh, I'll just go and get one stone. I'll, I'll fit, defeat the guy. No, no, no. He was going to see this to the end. He was going to do more than what was required. He was going to walk in a sense 
the extra mile. He was going to do the dif- he was going to do the difference that would uh, needed to be done, you know. And uh, he because David was more than a more than enough person. He wasn't a just enough person. He was not the kind of guy, guy who went home when he was looking after the sheep and said, "Hey, Dad, there was a lion and there was a bear, so I've run off." And, and what probably would his dad have said? Well, you would have done enough, son. You've got to be safe. You've got to do all that you can do. That's understandable, son. No, no, no. Not David. David took him on. David defeated him. David had learned that a just enough spirit, a just enough spirit never leads you to the place of fulfilling and being and having all that you can be. Because the principle of God is that God will do it when we do more than enough when we do more than enough. And, so, when, and so, so David would have understood Jesus when Jesus came along and said, you've got to walk that extra mile. Jesus, when Jesus came along and said, if a Roman soldier dumps his stuff on the ground and says, hey, you pick it up, walk a mile. And Jesus said, walk the extra. Because to be honest with you, the impact is always in the extra. The miracle is always in the extra. The, the blessing of God is in the extra. I look in our own ministry life. I look at the ministry that we have here. If we did just enough, oh, we'd probably get by, but we would never achieve, we'd never reach, we'd never help as many people as we can when we do the extra. And so so here's the question. In your health, are you just doing enough to be healthy or are you doing the extra to make sure that you're living a good life? In, In your marriage, have you got a good marriage or are you doing the extra? I talked to a man who said to me, he said, I come home every day, surely that's enough. And, and he, said, I, he said, I never tell my wife anymore that I love her. I never, tell, I never do anything for my wife to show her that I, any of those things because she knows because I come home. And, and, and I remember talking to his wife and she basically said to me, they have a good marriage, but not a great marriage. There are some of you who are not the best of parents because you're doing enough to be a parent, but you're not doing all that you could do to be a parent. In this era of this pandemic that we're in right now, you can do enough to get by or you can do more than enough so that when this pandemic comes to an end, when it is, you're placed well to be able to live in greatness and in wonder and and in a place of achieving much more because of what you did right now. One of my staff reminded me of my sister-in-law. And my sister-in-law is looking after a husband who who about 10 years ago, one day who was a perfectly healthy man, one day had a bleed in his brain. And then a few days later had, had a secondary bleed and became crippled. And he, he, is, he, is, he is completely dependent on her. He's in a wheelchair. He's completely dependent. And this woman, uh, my sister-in-law, she just doesn't do enough. She basically is doing more than enough. She is doing the extra. She's living in the miracle of the presence of God in her life because she's doing more than what is required of her right now. What do you need to do? What do you need to do right this very minute to live in a more than enough place? Now, you can stop and say, well, you know, I could go to any motivational course and they'd say, listen, look at Steve Jobs, the guy who founded Apple. He worked night and day. He did more than most people did. You can look at Bill Gates. He did the same. He came along and, and, and he did more than enough. And you can stop and say, well, they're all business people. But there are many people who are the hidden people in our lives who do more than enough to make life work. If you had met my mother, my mother was someone, she, cre- she created a wonderful life for our family because my mum always was working at making our home this amazing place for all of us. It wasn't perfect, but was it amazing? And you can stop and say, well, that's all good motivational stuff. But the principle of God is under it when we surrender our life to God. Now, there was a story in Matthew chapter 5, verse 25. There's a story of a woman who is suffering from hemorrhages. She's been bleeding for 12 years. For 12 years, she's she's been bleeding. And one day she thinks to herself, you know, I'm not allowed to be outside. 
the law of the land is when you're when you're in it, you know when you uh, you're bleeding you're unclean so therefore you affect the way people live their life and people who are in the economy and the way they trade according to their law if you like that you're meant to be kept locked away and she decides well I'm going to go out and I'm going to do more she said I don't want to be like this and she hears that Jesus is coming coming along and so what does she do She doesn't just stop and say to herself, well, I'm just going to let Jesus pass by. She walks up when she's not allowed to be outside. She does what she does. this, And then she reaches through the crowd and she touches his cloak because she thinks to herself, if I can just touch him, I'll be healed. I'll be healed. And immediately she changed. See, others are doing casually what she's doing intentionally. And she receives the healing in her body. And Jesus turns around and says, who touched me? And all the disciples and apostles said to him, but, but everyone's touching you, Jesus. And he said, no, 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 this was a different touch. This was the touch of intention. This was just not the crowd pushing against me. This was someone who wanted me. This is not someone who just by circumstance had to be there. This was someone who's made a decision. And who was it who got the blessing? She did. What in your life do you need to do that's extra? What do you need to do to step in to the kingdom principle of God? That God blesses us as we step forward as David did. We use all of our gifts and talents and we allow the blessing of God to come upon those circumstances. And it may not make us wealthy. It may not make us famous or well known. But it changes the entire dynamic of our life for this reason. Because we're constantly aware of I'm doing my best. I'm doing the extra And God is making up for the rest. God is winning the battle. Remember the story of Peter. Peter, one day, Jesus finds him uh, on the beach and he's been out fishing all night. And Jesus said to him, what have you caught? And he said, well, I've caught nothing. And Jesus says, go out again, go out again, go out again and throw the net on the other side that you threw it last time. And Peter says, oh, gosh. I don't feel like it. We fished all night. All night I fished. And Peter says to him, yeah, Jesus says to him, yeah, I know, but push out and throw the net out on the other side. Now, if you know anything about fishing in those days, it wasn't as easy as just go out in the pictures that I've seen. I remember I used to have one of these kids' Bibles when I was little, my family, a family Bible that had all pictures on it, and you just see the, the, the picture of this, and it's just a boat, and there's just a net on the other side that's full of fish. But if you understood fishing in those days, they had to row out. They then had to let down the net. They let down net. They would, they would, they would go along. They'd go around. They'd loop it around. There was a lot of work and Peter says this, I fished all night. I don't, want to do, I, I don't want to do extra fishing. I don't want to do more fishing. And then he stops and he says, but because you, you who are a carpenter, not even a fisherman, but because of who you are, because of what I've seen, I'll do the extra. And we know the story. He, he, they haul in this huge amount of fish huge amount of fish because what's he doing what are all of these stories about they're not just about you know work harder and get rich because that's what the world says to us what these are is I'm going to put in the maximum capacity of my ability and talent and I am going to trust that God will partner with me and God will work with me and God will do the more that I can even do and bring the blessing in my life if today You want to be a great parent. Stop and ask yourself the question, what do I need to do to improve my parenting? And then make a decision to do those things. Do you need to read a book? Do you you need to go do a course? Do you need to just sit down and think a bit? Do you need to get up a bit earlier? Do 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 you need to change a few practices? In other words, Where in your life do you need to, what the the Bible word, repent? What's repent mean? Change. Where do you need to make some changes? And as you make the change, you say, God, come. And God changes. God takes our effort and blesses the effort and magnifies the fruit of it. So so we can do that in our own life. But it's not just, I need to be be a better parent. I'll read a book. Oh, look, I've I've learned a few principles. I'm a better mum or dad right now. Because there's a hollowness to that, that Christians are able to tap into and be able to say, I'm going to do my best. I've read a book. I am better. But now I'm inviting the power of God in to win the victory. 
to win, to win and to take it to another level that all the books in the world, all the preparation in the world, all the, all the, all the thoughtfulness in the world will not lift me to. Because when we begin to live by the principle of God of doing the extra, because the miracle is always on the extra. If the miracle comes to the person who reaches out, the, the, the man who couldn't see, who climbs the tree, just to climb up the tree so he can see, it's him that Jesus stops and talks to. There's story after story after story. The people who come along and rip open the roof because they're carrying a paralytic and that who's, who's, who needs healing and they lower him down, they do the extra. Because when they came to the house, they stopped and went, oh, listen, there's crowds. Oh no, we'll come back tomorrow. We'll come back tomorrow. Maybe we can get Jesus on another time. They said, no, 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 we can do extra. We can hop on the roof. That's a bit excessive. We can get on the roof. We can pull the roof apart. We'll have to fix it afterwards. We can, who, who got the blessing? There are many of us today who are not experiencing the blessing of God because we're not seeking to get close to God. What we're trying to do is we're just trying to read a book. We're doing another self-help course. And that will never get us and release the power of God in our life. So here's here's three things. Here's three things that if we want to experience the miracles of God in our life that we need to do, if we want to see the miracles of God in our life, number one is you have to do the extra. You have to do the extra and then it releases the power of God when we say, God, come. Number two, you have to be intentional. It doesn't happen accidentally. It doesn't happen accidentally. You have to be intentional. I'm going to be a better parent. I'm going to be a better friend. I'm going to, be, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to start a, a better business. I'm going to operate my business better from here on in. I'm changing the way I mean. I'm inviting God into my circumstances. I'm going to have a better marriage because I'm going to invest the time that I need to. And I'm inviting God into that marriage. Uh, and, the, and the list goes on. And, and then finally, I'm going to do it no matter how I feel. I don't want to throw out my nets on the other side. I don't feel like throwing out my net. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. But if you do the extra, if you do intentional, if you overcome the emotions that sometimes stop and say, I don't want to do any more. It's amazing when you overcome that, how God comes. So, so what we need to do, if we want to live great according to the principles of the kingdom of God, do we want to live all that we can be with God in our life is that we step, out, we, do, we step out and we do more and we invite God. More and we invite God. More and we invite God. Because you don't have to do the more. Your marriage will still stay together. You don't have to do the more. You'll still be a parent. You don't have to be the more and you'll still get decent res- results uh, in your study. You don't have to do the more and you'll still have a career. You don't. And I want you to think right now, how many people do you know who have those things and you would define them all as good? But they're not great. Think about your parents, your brothers or sisters, friends that you know. All of us know people that are good and have, the, and have all these things that are good but they don't have that element of the great that God wants to put in our life. So the extra releases, when we're Christian and we've yielded our life to God, the extra releases the power of God into our circumstance to give us victory in the day to day to day of our life. Imagine today, if you made a decision to review your life in all its aspects, to review your life and then to say, what is the extra that I need to do in the place where I am today. And I'm going to invite God to make up the difference, to defeat the areas of my life that I can't defeat, but I'm going to do more than just enough. You'd be a different person. God would bless you abundantly uh, and God would be part of your life. Loving Father, I thank you today that you care for us, you love us and you want to bless us and you want us to live according to a principle that says when we go further according to our best and we surrender to you, that the combination of our best unleashes the power of heaven in our life, doing the extra. Because we, because we, as we do go as far as we can go, we then stop and say, and now God, take it from here, that you bless and bring results far more than our best effort could ever come. 
Come Holy Spirit to us, release your best in us. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. One of the things the Scripture says to us who do ministry is that we're to bring our needs and we're to place them before the body of Christ. And I wanna ask you today, would you stand with me and help me to proclaim the Gospel all over the world? Whether that is done through television, online, or whether that's done literally at events, I wanna ask you if you'd help me to proclaim Christ so that people's lives are changed, so that people uh, can respond to God in their life, connect with God, and come to a deeper relationship with God. That's what we are about. And it does change people's lives. I call everybody who gives, as you've heard me say many times, a faith builder because we're trying to build the faith of people. To all of our partners, and I'd love you to consider becoming a partner with us. Someone who can contributes regularly has gone into our website, set up a way that you can contribute regularly in order that we can proclaim the gospel. I couldn't do this without you. I want to thank you. And I want to thank you because right now I know so many of you are going to discern what's God asking of you to do in your life. And I pray that as you pray for us, as you help us, that more people would come to a deeper relationship with God in their life right now. You can go to this address on the screen or go to the Give tab. And together, let's change the lives of people as we introduce people to our Lord God. Uh, Jesus Christ. Loving Father, we thank You today that You're with us. We pray, Lord God, that You allow us to experience You more powerfully in our life, to make the decisions You call us to, to make the decisions even to support me in proclaiming the Gospel around the world. Lord God, speak to us right now. And Father, we make this prayer in the Name of Jesus through the power of Your Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, thank you for being with me. I pray that you've been blessed today. I pray that you pray that God speaks to you and that you would listen to God, knowing that when God speaks, you have His power to do what He tells you to go and do. Hey, God bless you. See you next time. And don't forget, wherever you are, God is never far from you.